Welcome, everyone. Welcome. I'm going to introduce speaker for this session. Um, it's Dean Theophilus, and he is a licensed alcohol and drug counselor, also a licensed professional clinical counselor, a Christian mental health therapist, um, working at Timberline Knowles Treatment Facility that's located in Lamont, Illinois. And he's going to be presenting to us about logotherapy and the treatment of addiction. So welcome, Dean. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for coming. Thank you, O'Camper, for letting me speak. This is my third time speaking at the O'Camper Conference. I just have found this a real blessing in my life and my career development. So it's just, I, the word always comes to mind when I come here is gratefulness, being with you all, connecting with you all, and sharing thoughts and ideas about being better professionals. So today, looking at logotherapy and the treatment of addiction, I come in this with kind of two goals, two goals. The first goal is, I think, I think the goal of Ocamper, too, is find the intersection between the world of treatment, particularly logotherapy, the theories behind that, the treatment of addiction, how we treat people with substance use disorders, addictive behaviors, and then our Orthodox Christian faith, spirituality. So the first goal I come to mind when I approach this lecture is that how can I bring those three things together the best I possibly can. The next goal or hope I have in this lecture is to keep this practical. A little bit about me, before I got a master's degree in counseling, I was a philosophy major. So I'd actually even heard of Viktor Frankl and, the, and stuff of local therapy even before that because of the philosophical bent and, and basis behind, his, behind local therapy. So, of course, I could come to this lecture and present all these kind of deep ideas, very complex ideas about local therapy, which they are, and they're beautiful and they're amazing. But I also want to keep this, well, keep this idea in mind. Well, how do I apply these ideas to help the person? How do I find these ideas and use these ideas in a way that can be compact and concise enough and meaningful enough to help those suffering with addiction? So I'll try to actually use... Uh, it's, one thing about, beautiful about local therapy is that it's been... I've used it in my practice with people who, you know, don't have a philosophy background. But I've, I've found ways to introduce these concepts to them in a way that's powerful and meaningful for them to help them recover from addiction. Particularly, I'm going to be looking at two books today. The first one, I always recommend this book, is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. If anyone's seen this book, a great book, not a very long read. It's probably a great summation of his work. If you want to understand what logotherapy is, I recommend reading this book. But the next book I'd recommend, especially for addiction counseling, it's a book I've used now. I mean, I've been practicing now for about seven years for addic addiction work. I, this is top of my list is one of the books I use for my practice, is The Addictive Personality by Craig Nacken. Craig Nacken is a therapist in Minnesota. And these are the two books I'm going to kind of use this lecture from. The ideas I'm talking about there are just strictly come from these books. Because what's so great is that I think Craig Nacken's work helped my practice and my work with people with addiction to really take all these beautiful ideas of logotherapy and bring them down in a way to help a person recover from addiction. And hopefully, actually, any, any addictive behavior or mental health disorder or problem, behavior problem in their life. So kind of an agenda, we're going to look at two concepts from logo logo, uh, logotherapy, the meaning of suffering in the existential vacuum, then look at the addictive personality, about the pleasure-centered, power-centered, and meaning-centered person, and then some brief orthodox perspectives on both those ideas. That's kind of the agenda with those two goals in mind. Brief, brief overview. Again, I, I mean, we could do a whole week, months, years on logotherapy, but it's a brief overview of logotherapy. It was founded by famed neurologist and psychiatrist Dr. Frankel, survival of the Holocaust. It stems from existential therapy. And existential therapy has a whole subsections and different formats of, of this modality. Um, but particularly existential therapy, if one way to define it is that its goal in therapy is to find how do you find meaning in life. So Viktor Frankl is, comes from the existential umbrella of therapy to looking at how can someone find meaning. And like I said again, the book Man's Search for Meaning is a wonderful synopsis of, first of his journey in the concentration camp because his story was a powerful one. I don't want to get too much, but he, he, was, he was stripped of everything in his life. He was a, you know, working in uh, Vienna. He's a wealthy you know, in psychology and psychiatry, but then the Nazis came, took that all away from him took his family away from him. He survives the concentration camps. After his going through the concentration camps, he comes to the United States, does his clinical work in the States, focusing on the idea of how we deal with finding meaning in a world of suffering. So the first half of the book is about his experience. The second half of the book is about logotherapy, breaking down some concepts. And again, it's, it's, I think it's fairly approachable among the many works he's done and lectures he's done. It's, it's a pretty approachable book. 
maybe it's a quote from, from Victor Frank himself of what is logotherapy. In logotherapy, the person is actually confronted with and reoriented toward the meaning of life. And to make him aware of this meaning can contribute much to his ability to overcome his neuroses. Again, the central part of it is looking at what is meaning in life and being aware of what meaning in life is can help you overcome psychological difficulties, the hardships in life. And just one little brief side point, because I'm Greek and I love the Greek language. <laughs> Logotherapy from the word logos, which he uses, defines as meaning. And of course, it could be simply as word, but as someone, people who know Greek very well know that logos is so much more than that. You know, logos could be the universe, God, the, the spirit of everything. There's, we, could, we could spend a whole year studying the logos itself. People have done that. But it's so beautiful that he used the word logos you know, in logotherapy as a sense of when we're working on this, we're looking for the logos. We're looking for that spirit, that essence of life. Breaking down logotherapy, I want to explore two points, two big points that's going to uh, move on in the treatment of addiction. But I'm looking at two of his major themes of logotherapy. And the first one is health through struggle. Viktor Frankl was very big on, and if you read this very initially, when you read the books on local therapy, he was very big on moving towards and confronting hardship and struggle in life. Moving towards and, can, and utilizing str struggle to get through difficult hardships. Side note is that when you read the first part of Man's Search for Meaning, it hits you hard. Powerful book, and it's very, very sad. I actually think I first read the book when I was, I was a teenager, and I, it, it, it rocked me, just how intense it was. The suffering was imminent. But Victor Frankl is very big on that, and so he knows his people, people in the concentration camp, when they go, they're stripped of everything they have. There's nothing left. The fellow people in the concentration camp either literally curl up into a ball and waste away in the midst of all this nihilistic suffering. They either become very bitter and angry in their time in the concentration camp, so they get, they get thrown in the concentration camp, they become angry people, their survival is done with brutishness, just, just nasty with other inmates, ending with the guards. But Victor Frankl has to take a third way a way of saying, let me embrace this hardship, this struggle in life, and let me find something more transcendent, more powerful. Victor Frankl talks about finding love in that struggling. And that so much guides his work when he, uh, for the rest of his life, his clinical work, because he wants to go with people who are struggling the most intense parts of their lives. and says, let's look towards what this struggle in your life is, and let's see that it's actually from there we can find a solution. Not run away from it, not hide it, not dismiss it, deny it. This quote from him, he writes, what man actually needs is not a tensionless state, but rather a striving, a struggling, a worthwhile goal. So he approaches if someone comes in with severe issues. A big one, he would talk about people struggling with severe, like, you know, stage four cancer, you know, significant burn victim units, people with terminal illnesses. And say, let's look upon this struggle in your life as a way to point you something greater for a larger worthwhile goal. He looks at this too. He says, mental health is based on a certain degree of tension, the tension between what one has already achieved and what one is still out to accomplish, or the gap between what one is, what one is and what one is, should become. Such a tension is inherent in the human being and therefore is indispensable for mental well-being. Looking at that tension, I'm going to come back to this again too, but this, is, this was a big piece of, of logotherapy. We're not going to deny, move away from the problems of life, we're going to confront them and realize that this tension can actually bring forth the betterment of ourselves. The next big piece the two big ones I'm looking at in local therapy is the existential vacuum. The existential vacuum means, as Frankel saw it, is the lack of and the struggle for finding life for a person. So kind of like what existential therapy is, you're wanting to find meaning in your life, you don't have it, you're having this existential vacuum, this emptiness, something's missing, you're looking for that meaning to help connect things, bring things together. So how much his work so much of his work is looking to address that. And so he has this quote, again, this is all from Man's Search for Meaning. The frustrated will to meaning is vicariously compensated for, the, by, for by a will to power, including the most primitive form of will to power, the will to money. In other cases, the place for a frustrated will to meaning is taken by the will to pleasure. And I bolded the will to meaning, the will to power, and the will to pleasure, because those are the big three that I'm going to use later in how to treat addiction. So sum up this, this quote right here. The idea is that we're, we have this desire, this drive, this will for meaning. And what's happening, it's being kind of attacked by both ends, covered by the will to power and the will to pleasure. So another way to look at local therapy, which Frank would talk about, is that your goal in th therapy is to have that, have that drive, that will to meaning, and, and move away from the will to pleasure and the will to power. So I literally would tell clients, okay, 
You have this will to meaning. Let's make sure we're not going to stay, move towards that and not towards just the will to pleasure and the will to power. So those, so those two concepts, I'm just creating the initial groundwork. Those two concepts of local therapy. And now we're going to connect it, connect it to addiction treatment. So then I go to this book. Again, I can't stress this. If anything you get from me today, actually, I actually just plug this book, The Addictive Personality by Craig Nacken. It was by Hazleton Pub- Publishing. Hazleton Addiction uh, Treatment Center is an addiction center in Minnesota. It's very well known. They've merged with Betty Ford, actually, now, so there's treatment centers all over the country. Um, this is where I actually went to school here at Hazleton Betty Ford. So he published it through that book. So Nacken takes the, these two ideas from biblical therapy, find the, having the will to meaning and struggle in life, when he comes toward a treatment of addiction. So Nacken starts particularly with this point, and it was so beautiful, actually. I, I'm so happy I got to listen to uh, Father Deacon Perry speak beforehand because this plays in what he just mentioned upstairs in his lecture, is that the opposite of addiction is connection. The opposite of addiction is connection. Nacken saw this. That in recovery, we're moving away from the horrors, the hardships, the pains of addiction we're moving towards is not just abstinence or sobriety, but connection. So Nacken's book, a little bit more explanation about Nacken's book, you know, he spends the first half of the book actually talking about the addictive cycle. So I'm not going to go into that too much. That could be a whole lecture of itself, but the first half of the book is the addictive cycle, how drugs keep in a loop. You keep using and using and human the behavioral pattern, the addictive pattern of that cycle. The second half is looking at, okay, now you want to recover, and what you're looking for is connection. What you want is connection. There's this innate drive. As I, again, I think it's so beautiful. It's, I, it's such beautiful coincidence, uh, almost wonderful, that, uh, this conference so great. Father Deacon Perry mentioned again that there's some natural nature of man to want to have connection. Nacken sees that too in his book, that a natural drive inside us to have connection. So Nacken's very big on in his book is that, okay, you want to connect. You want to connect with your loved ones again. You want to connect with healthy communities. Nacken comes from the 12-step tradition of Alcohols Anonymous, which is the recovery support group. And he says you want connection with your support group, with your home group, with the members of AA. And also particularly you want to connect with the spiritual. And so here's where I hope, again, we can intersect the world of local therapy, the world of treatment of addiction, and then the spiritual, because Nacken says, too, there's an innate drive for connecting with the divine. There's an innate drive to connect with something greater than ourselves. That's his quote right here. Uh, he says, it, the drive for connection, is a force that helps focus our attention away from our addictive impulses and towards renewal that pushes us to seek out and connect with things outside of ourselves and with something larger than ourselves. Nacken, I think, actually says we have the desire for the divine. In, in 12-step treatment of addiction, and several addiction treatment facilities do this, Hazleton does this a lot. When we, I, I used to internship there, You know, the goal in treatment was to find your higher power, to find something spiritual. And they'd actually would use this book as a reminding of talking about, well, there's this innate drive inside of you that wants to connect and wants to connect with something greater, something transcendent outside of yourself. Because I hope to, what's great about this idea of of connection and using some logotherapy concepts, because you can start talking about people, well, what spirituality mean to you, especially if they're not religious or Christian. You can start by talking about, well, what does connection mean to you? What does it mean to have a connection with something greater than yourself? And that's how what we would do in addiction treatment to actually get them started thinking about what your higher power is, what God means to you, is thinking about, okay, what does it mean to connect with something greater than yourself? So Nacken elaborates. He says, okay, you have this drive for connection. You want to connect. You want to be in recovery. You have, this, this, you have this, this impulse. And this connection, what he sees again, is connection is hindered by the drive for power and pleasure, going back to what Frankl speaks of. He says, what's going to, we're going to stop this drive for connection. What's going to stop your drive to connect with something higher, a higher power, connect with your loved ones, people you care about, is that power and pleasure impulse. So Nacken sees again that what's the goal? We move toward a meaning-centered life. In a meaning-centered life, we find connection. In a meaning-centered life, we find connection, we find deeper love, deeper care for other people. And we, we stay away from pleasure and power because that will, what will occur is not finding connection, but worse yet, get back to addictive behaviors. That will, will either go back into relapse, the drugs will come back in, the addictive behaviors will come back in. So Nacken, like Viktor Frankl says, Move toward meaning, because in meaning we can find that connection. In meaning we can then connect with something higher than ourselves, with God, with spirituality, with a new way of living in love. 
So what Nakin does, and, and Nakin does, and I, again, this is why I, this book's so great, he literally just says, okay, your, qu your next question is, well, what is a meaning-centered person? What is a power-centered person? What is a pleasure-centered person? He's like, great, I'll tell you. And, with, so, and, and actually, this is probably the rest of my lecture. Uh, he just breaks this down. He says, if we're going to figure this out, I want you to differentiate between these three type of people so you can be aware of that. And it was so interesting when I used this book in the treatment of working with, with people in recovery, suffering with addiction, they're like, oh, this is totally new to me. They weren't even thinking about, oh, yeah, what does it mean to, to have a personality type like this? Because it really asks you to evaluate, well, how have I living my life? How can I live a better life? And that can create the template for that. So he breaks it down. What are those three personalities like? How can we move toward a meaning-centered personality? So how does he do it? He breaks down a, per a personality into like four parts. The person's vision for life, the person's goal for life, how they spend their time in life, their values in life, and the byproducts of life. So I'm going to read this and talk about it. So each chapter kind of goes through, okay, if you're this type of person, this is what it could look like. And a lot of times we may share personality types of all three types of these. So he says, if you're just a pleasure-centered person, this is what it would look like. Pleasure-centered person's vision toward life is life is pain, but pleasure makes life worth living. The goal is to avoid the pain and anxiety that are part of life to maximize one's pleasurable sensations. Time to focus is on the, mo to focus on the moment and controlling it to avoid pain and receive as much pleasure as possible. Value, the value of an event, an object, or a person is determined by its ability to produce pleasurable feelings, and the byproducts are grief, sadness, boredom, and depression. So the key things that come from here, and I point this out with clients when I work with, we acknowledge there's pain. Life is pain. It's a big part of existential therapy with local therapy. We acknowledge the struggle in life. But what's the next part of that vision? Pleasure makes life worth, that word worth, worth living. Pleasure makes life worth living. So right then and then, there's this weird dynamic with, with, ple with pleasure is that in addiction, what's very common with drugs is that drugs provide an instant gratification. When you take, when you take a shot of, shot of a alcohol, when you take you know, heroin, marijuana, all these drugs, it's an instant reaction. There's no delay. If you want to feel good, you know, you talk to people with an opioid addiction, you, you use the opioid immediately to feel good. If you want to feel that high stimulus, you take methamphetamine, you take cocaine. If you want to feel numb or just loopy, you drink. But that key piece is time. If I'm feeling bad, I want to feel immediately good. So all of a sudden, I start orienting my life around removing as much pain as possible and feeling good right now. It's not about just like, oh, pleasure, good things, you know. I think in, initially this idea is like, I'm not, well, this isn't against good, happy feelings. But this, this, in, this constant obsessiveness, you've got to move away all bad thoughts and only feel good. You've got to have that stimulant, immediacy. But again, time is on the moment, but the moment is about how do I feel good immediately. If I'm feeling down or, or bum, or there's a day that goes by, a week that goes by, I'm feeling good, that's terrible, because I've got to feel good all the time. I can't, I can't take, take through the problems in a slow, patient way. Again, a value, an object, event is only determined by how it makes me feel good. I'm not feeling good today. I'm in trouble. Uh, actually, can we save questions for this? I have a time. I'm going to go through this. And we can review, I want to review all this at the end of it. So, and again, that feeds so much, so much well into addiction because, again, what's happened so much in early recovery is that there's such a low tolerance for discomfort. You know, I, I, when we work with inpatient facilities, the people would come in and everything would annoy me, annoy them. The lights are too bright. Programming's too long. The food's too bad. I can't deal a little. I can't deal with an ounce of waiting. People would just spend groups, counseling sessions, completely on. I'm waiting too long in inpatient treatment. A whole session would be around just how do you wait more? How do you deal with waiting? Because again, it's that instant. They want to feel good, and and the byproducts again are grief, sadness, boredom, and depression. We'll go more into that because he breaks down what happens when you live with this mindset. He says more in a pleasanter life. Emotions are always in temporary states. It's, it, the, it, one thing about an emotional health is to realize that emotions will ebb and flow throughout life. Even today, you will feel, you will feel good in the day, you'll feel kind of so-so. Maybe a week will go by, you'll feel really good, you'll feel really bad in a part of a week or a day. But with drugs, it's always, it's, it's never, there's, it's all immediate. If I'm feeling bad, I'm feeling really bad, I gotta feel good all of a sudden. 
There's no, long, there's no understanding of the longevity of emotions. Relationship situations are unstable because they're always in flux. One's lifestyle is always reactive. Again, I go back to that time piece. You're not, there's no patience in this. If you aren't making me feel happy, I'm bored with you, let's go somewhere something else. Very common among lo- young addicts. I used to work in an adolescent unit. It was so hard for them to realize that actually relationships or friendships can be based on actually taking your time with somebody, mm-hmm. just hanging out together. And especially in the world of you know, electronics, of social media, of technology, when everything's immediate, it's very hard to realize how to be actually just chill with somebody. It was very foreign to them. Intensity is more important than intimacy. That's a big one. It's, a, it's very common in early relationships, the idea that you may find someone, you fall deeply in love with that person. They're beautiful. They're attractive. You're having a bunch of fun together. You know, they're exciting. But what about when relationships go kind of on long stretches of struggle? What if that person you care about is sick or struggling? You know, we talk a lot about this with relationships, with couples counseling, is that actually your marriage or your relationship will be more fulfilled during the difficult moments, not when everything's happy, happy, happy. A testament of a good relationship is how we get through the hard times. One sense of happiness comes from a transitory state. Again, this, this, there's no internal happiness. A positive sense of power is never internalized. It's a great point to that. There's no internalized power. Another analogy I take with this with clients is like a tree. When you have a good sense of what it means to be content, worthy, it's like roots of a tree planted. So if the winds of life, the storms of life come upon you, you are steady and, con- and focused on something greater, not tossed around, blown out of its roots. That's internalized power. Now, again, there can be bursts of happiness and happy times and happy power, but that ability to get through all the ups and downs of life, to stay steadfast, a predatory side of when nature dominates, the end product of excessive, pointless hedonism. And so hedonism, again, is a great word, just, just base pleasure. And I, and, I, and I make this point, too, that our, I think our culture, to some degree, is in addiction treatment. Uh, I do this in tre- addiction treatments with groups. I do groups on this. Um, is Our culture is is tense toward hedonism, instant gratification. With consumerism, with media, I make this joke sometimes, especially with my male clients. I said, I, when I, I like watching football. <laughs> I actually have to leave the room when the commercials go on because what are commercials all based? Immediate, you gotta feel good. You gotta drink a good beer, you gotta drive a good car, you gotta perform better, all that kind of stuff. Instant, 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 instant. Our society is based on that. And one of the hallmarks of early recovery what we work with clients on is to realize, well, how can you be content when days you're bored? Because boredom could be a major relapse. What does it mean to have a kind of a low week or a low month even? Like what if you're just, you, what if a, what you, your early recovery, what if the first couple of months of your recovery, they're not terrible, but they're not they're just kind of just there. You're just staying sober, going to meetings, doing the best you can, nothing super exciting. Usually those times when it's kind of lull period, nothing's really going on, easy relapse time. Because again, the internalized sense of power is overmassed by I gotta feel good immediately. I can't be I, content, no, I can't be patient. Again, if you have a question, we'll review all this at hope at the end. So the next part of this would be the power centered person. So, so the next step would be, okay, you wanna move away from the pleasured way of thinking, now we look at power centered life. So I'll just go through this again, of this one. Uh, the power center vision is life is a struggle to get as much power as possible. Only power will bring true comfort and pleasure. The goal to get as much power as one can to push for what one believes is right. The focus is on controlling the moment, accumulating enough power to make up for losses later, especially in old age. The value of an event, an object, or a person defined by their power potential and the byproducts are an artistic state of anxiety, paranoia, and fear. Now this, this is like the next step for Nacken because they say, okay, if you're moving away from just thinking i got to feel good all the time. Well, now is really what it means to feel valuable. Let's look at look what it means to have internalized power, not surface-level level power. So what's a common, almost cliche sometimes, I tell us, I tell us point in, in groups for in addiction facilities, you know, you see all these Hollywood movie stars with addiction. You see people who have, addiction does not discriminate. People, Fortune 500 CEOs, people with, with millions of dollars, People under, under their control, people who have wealth and fame and fortune, yet they're miserable inside. I mean, we, I mean, we, we, watch, we watch those movies uh, in treatment. We watch, you know, the Johnny Cash movie, Walk the Line, as a reminder that, again, all the trimmings of life that may seem appealing, like status, people respecting you, acclaim, title, may just present a mask of a lack of what truly internalized power looks like. Because what happens is that it becomes this way to, this comes to surface 
kind of attachment to keep you unable to get to the vulnerable, more intimate sides of yourself. It's, it's funny, they have all these things that, that may seem really tantalizing of being right, having control and power, that word control, being right, being in control. But what's the byproducts? This anxiety, paranoia, and fear. This reality would be you'd see people, these constant stories of speakers being like, yeah, I had all the money in the world, a perfect house, everything, but I still felt afraid inside. Something was lacking. Those, those objects really weren't bringing out what I really needed to feel this internal sense of strength. A little more in the power-centered life, being control and right is all important. Relations are dominant submissive. One's lifestyle is narcissistic. Blame is essential for to keep power. One cannot be wrong. So another point I look at this too is that I kind of take this a lot from examples. So I, have a, I used to do an adolescent young men's group. And a lot of young men are like, well, Dean, I, I want to have a good life. I want to be, I mean, they were young, so I want to be a football pl- star. I want to be a, a, a famous music artist. I want to I make money. I'm like, great, great. If you want to do that, you can. But how are you going to treat your family? How are you going to love your wife? or love your children. Because you may be the best CEO in the world. You may be the most powerful man or the best athlete or the well-acclaimed writer or author. But how are you treating the intimate relationships? The relationships that involve patience, forgiveness, humility. Because this is when you hear a lot of this too, uh, time too, because I work with, also with men with anger issues. This idea that they may have used that anger to help them succeed in business, but all of a sudden that anger becomes their control to treat their family poorly, to abuse their family. Because you're not viewing them as a true connected partner, a compatriot, an intimate partner to love together, to even co-suffer together, but it's a dominant submissive relationship where you're blaming. I want to be right. I want to show you that I'm right. Power is seen as producing pleasure. Again, the status, the control, the being right all the time. Somehow that brings back, we get back to pleasure all over again. Relationships are important if they add to one's power. Destructive predatory side of one's nature dominates. When stability is tied to preserving power, despite the surface calm, power-focused people are highly unstable. Again, that mask, that sense of are you tapping in to something more meaningful internally, or is it just the surface mask of I want to be controlled and being right? Again, appealing, but to actually work on and examine that. So a lot of groups in therapy will work on, well, let's actually find the authentic you, the intimate you, and from there we can find actually the meaning, which leads into the meaning-centered person. The meaning-centered person, vision. Life is a series of struggles. Embracing these struggles, we learn to extract meaning from them. To get close to the essence of higher spiritual truths, God, as possible. Putting these truths into action, time, the main focus on the moment, and putting higher values and principles into practice in the present. Principles are more important than the self. Our value as humans is that we can represent these principles on earth. By price of peace, joy, serenity, plus the pain of constant change. And so again... We go back to that initial point of Viktor Frankl. Life is a series of struggles, embracing these struggles, finding meaning from these struggles, not dismissing them or denying them through pleasurable feelings, not constructing a narrative that it's my job to conquer others, thus to, uh, thus to somehow avoid the struggles in life, understanding that the struggles can actually bring forth great, powerful spiritual truths, those values. So particularly, we start looking and asking, well, what do you actually believe in? What are your values? For Viktor Frankl, to the idea of putting vi- values into practice, he found the values of love. He talked about his time in the concentration camps is that, can I bring forth love in this moment? And one thing I'd start asking clients and people in addiction treatment is, okay, what do you believe in? Can we bring, can we bring forth some higher principle in your life and, and help you get through these difficult times? And if it is God, a higher power that they're looking for, I'm like, okay, how can God represent these principles of love, of kindness? How can we use these guiding principles of your faith, the guiding principles that connect you with God to help you get through these difficult times rather than avoid it or dismiss it or minimize it? I like this. Principles are more important than the self. Uh, I, I think I've heard so much here, especially in, a, in the O'Camper Conference, the idea that the self, we still got to respect the self, but we're going to let our principles guide us, not have our self be in constant control. In the pleasure-centered, the power-centered mindset, the self is centered. It's either i got to feel good all the time, that's what makes life worth living, or i got to be control over time and power, that makes life worth living. With this, instead of saying, no, you are, your self is still going to be uplifted, strengthened in an, an internal, powerful way, but you're now guided by something greater than yourself, some higher principle. Again, many people I'd work with have no principles. We start our first session, I'm like, what do you guys believe in? I'm like, I don't know. 
Our whole sessions would just be, we have groups based on what are your values. It, it'd be eye-opening for them, especially work with people who were raised in traumatic homes, broken homes, had no, no values to learn under them as young kids. Just the mere idea of thinking about, oh, I can have values and principles. I'm not burdened by just the world and what I've seen around myself. Start building a relationship under values and principles. Again, what, and then we look at the byproducts. It was mentioned in the lecture beforehand. Peace, serenity, joy, plus the pain of constant change. We're allowing the both andness of that. There can be peace, there can be joy, but there's going to be change and hardships. And that's, it'd be hard, I, we talk about this a lot with, with my clients, is that, okay, you're going to find joy in your life. But you're going to find joy even when you're going to go through difficult times too. So key in early recovery when this whole new world of recovery is this unknown territory, this unknown world. You can approach that, get through that, and find healing. More about the mean-centered life. Little importance of being right or wrong. The self is not seen as the center of the universe. Despite life changes, one stays attached to the eternal. One feels comfortable yet cautious around power and pleasure. Humility. One strives to work love into the struggle to extract meaning from life. One forms permanent relationships. So a big one here would be humility, not seeing the center of the universe. I can now bring forth values to help other people. Permanent relationships, not temporary relationships, not predatorial relationships, permanent, long-lasting relationships where you can get through issues. One tries to work in love, as Viktor Frankl talked about, bringing in love into the world of struggle. And I like this point, too. One feels comfortable, yet cautious around power and pleasure. I did this a lot with, my, with the younger guys I worked with. I actually use the example sometimes. Again, I'm using a sports example because I love sports. We all know who Troy Palomalo is. Yes, yeah, the famous Steelers football player who's also an Orthodox Christian. But I would take an example of that, well, here's a guy who had a lot of success. He was a football player. He made some money with commercials. And I'm like, oh, all, all the young men are like, yeah, 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 I want that. But guess what? I said, because I've, I've, I've heard stories about him, because I know people who know him personally. He's a very humble man. He's very good to his family. So again, am I, am I saying we have to all become monastics and avoid all pleasurable things and all good things in life? No. But again, the internal principles are guiding us. Something greater is guiding us. We're connected towards that. Yes, the fruits of our labor will come forth. We will, we will succeed in life. We'll have fun times in life. We'll go on vacation. And yet, there's something greater we're attached to. We're attached to something permanent. We're finding love. A state attached to the internal. That connective drive that Nacken talked about. That connective drive that's different from addiction is guiding us now and finding, us, finding so much more joy and meaning in life. Last few slides. Just a brief talk about an orthodox perspective. Again, I do not have all even education to begin to speak about perspectives on this, but I want to do a little piece of this that I helped me in my clinical work. I start with this icon of the crucifixion, and I'll tell a story. So I worked, my first job in the addiction field was in a faith-based treatment facility. It was an inpatient facility, um, and it was, it was intense because I worked with guys who had uh, criminal backgrounds, very traumatic upbringings. Uh, I had groups that sometimes I felt my life was in trouble. You know, it was very intense and scary. These guys were we're, we're tough guys. They're tough guys, and they were angry. And I, I tell a story in early recovery because you're in recovery, and, and everything just without the drug, life feels miserable. You know, if you're an opiate addict, actually things hurt more. You're in more pain because you're detoxing. You know, if you don't have stimulants anymore, you can't even you can't even have any energy anymore. So these groups would just be so difficult because they just would come in and they're just talking about, oh, this is bad, this is bad, Dean. I mean, I'd have sessions where all we would talk about is how treatment sucks. It's bad, you know. So they were all, but there was a faith-based facility, and most of them were, were Christians and wanted some Christian approach to the group. So I said one day, I brought this icon screen, a uh, picture of the icon, in the group. And I started a group like this. I said, guys, it's difficult. It's really tough right now. I don't want to sugarcoat that. Because, by the way, the previous groups are like, oh, don't worry, guys. Let's think positive thoughts and... You know, everything will be okay. That didn't work. <laughs> they, they, they drove me right out of the group room. I'm like, okay, you're right. Treatment's hard. This isn't easy. It's not easy for me. And, and I'm not going to dismiss or belittle the fact that you guys are having a really difficult time right now, especially with less than a month of recovery. But let's look at the, this picture, the icon of the cross, of Christ on the cross. And I said, Christ is actually closer to all of us right now than we have possibly realize. Another common thing they would say is, I feel God so distant from me because I'm not doing well right now. That actually God is in this room right now as we speak is because he suffered with us, he suffered for the life of the world, that even in our struggling right now, in our suffering, we are closer to the divine than we realize. If we take time to kind of reflect on that, that this struggle right now can actually bring us closer to God, closer to Christ, we can find some immense healing right now. We spent the majority of this group looking at this icon and reminding that this icon can lead, will lead to the resurrection, will lead to the joy of a greater, of a greater, greater union with Christ.
reflecting on that hardship, realize that there can be something greater going on here. And I, and I just use some of these quotes. Again, there's so many scripture passages on this, but just, you know, clearly from, from Peter, First Peter, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with that same mind. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself to me, for me. So I just use those scripture passages as, as a reminder that I, I've used this idea of like, okay, let's approach this struggling. Because you'd have guys that come in treatment, treatment, addiction treatment with so much shame and guilt and thinking that because I've struggled so much, that God's not with me. Or I'm not a spiritual person. I'm not a, whole, a, a faithful person. And I flip the switch. I'd say, actually, I, I disagree. That actually, even in your struggling, he was there. And the fact that you've gone through your struggling and still trying to attach yourself and bring yourself toward the eternal, towards him, makes you a stronger person. That, that, I think one of the beautiful things of Christian teaching and Christian theology is that we can use, that we have this loving God who came to us and suffered for us. We can use it to help us through our darkest times. And so pivotal, I think, particularly people in those early parts of addiction. Because the beauty of it is that, I also tell them this, is that there will come a time where you will have 20 years of sobriety. There will come a time if you stick with this program, you stay in recovery, you will find sobriety. And guess what? You will look back at those times and you'll find value in them. A common thing is that they talk about old timers in AA of realizing that their initial, um, their initial days of recovery were just as valuable as their 20, 30, 40 years. Because they realize that even the hard times and the good times all can bring them closer to a greater well-being and a greater sense of recovery and well-being. And so I also end with actually this prayer, another Orthodox perspective. This is from the prayer of the monks of Optina. Um, many of you have heard this prayer. Um, I have said this prayer much times in my life. I think this is a wonderful prayer as reminding like how to live a meaningful life. And I actually think it takes a very good stance of looking at approaching struggles in life. And I think all the principles we just talked about, about a being-centered person, is embodied in this prayer. So I'm going to read it. And then I think we'll end with that. And I want to talk to, I really hope this time we talk now about these ideas. Um, so I'm just going to close with this prayer and, and then we can, we can talk. So this prayer says, O Lord, grant that I may meet all that this day, this coming day brings to me with spiritual tranquility. Grant that I may, may fully surrender myself to your holy will. At every hour of this day, direct and support me in all things. Whatsoever news may reach me in the course of the day, teach me to accept it with a calm soul and a firm conviction that all is subject to your holy will. Direct my thoughts and feelings in all my words and actions, in all unexpected occurrences. Do not let me forget that all is sent down from you. Grant that I may deal straightforwardly and wisely with every member of my family, neither embarrassing nor saddening anyone. O Lord, grant me the strength to endure the fatigue of the coming day and all the events that take place. Direct my will and teach me to pray, to believe, to hope, to be patient, to forgive, and to love. Amen. Thank you. So, yeah, we, we got, I think we got time. We got to... Thank you for a great presentation. This is the third time I've heard you. And um, my question was around pleasure-seeking. So I certainly understand how um, drugs, sex, food um, would be relevant there. But what do you call people like workaholics that never feel they're doing enough? Yeah. Um, I, I probably would take both a little bit of the power center part two. I, I would, we've, we've talked about this particularly in the context of, of the idea of, you know, is, is the work you're doing this sense of somehow oh, I'm being, a, I'm really focused on my work now, I'm defined by my work. Well, are you defined by your work? Is the, is the status of your job or the fact you're a hard worker is the only thing that's defining you right now? So I kind of somewhat, I would go at an angle back to the meaning center person. I'm like, so what are your values? Okay, so you want to be a hard worker, but if a hard worker is at the price of your mental well-being, if you're just working all the time, well, then you're kind of missing the point. You're putting too much attachment on the job rather than the guiding principles. So I, it was very common. I mean, in early recovery, guys would be like, yeah, I'm just working 60, 70-hour weeks, man. I, I'm going to do it. I'm like, well, wait a second. Hold on. Like, I'm glad you're eager to work, but I want the integrity of, your, of what it means to work hard and in, in in being kind to yourself, of being dis, disciplined and caring yourself rather than just saying, putting all my attachment toward the job or to the fact that I'm working hours on end to make more money or stuff like that. Um, 
it's it's yeah it's a it's a weird kind of balance with that so i kind of see a little bit at play there yeah and just a quick follow-up i'm an executive coach and what's happening is with lean organizations you've got like one person doing the job of three people mm. just to get by yeah. so um and it's not in their head necessarily that they want to be a workaholic yeah. but i just you know whether you're in a caring ministry like a psychologist or a priest or in a lean mean um role yeah I see a lot of that coming up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dean, so much. Yeah. It was a great presentation. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, when, from a clinical perspective, when I'm dealing with a young person who's in that pleasure-centered phase, what, what do you see are some good signs that they're starting to really move towards the meaning-centered? Because one of the things that I've seen over the years is, um, we'll try to get somebody into, let's say, a 30-day uh, rehab center. And I wonder sometimes, has the industry said, well, 30 days is the only way we could yeah. do it? Or, But if we're in practice and trying to help somebody who does not want to go to a voluntary you know, inpatient doing 30 days, what are some key signs that you typically see that they are transitioning away from the pleasure center to the meaning center? Yeah. It's cool because I th- actually think the biggest sign, I, and I've told parents this, they're actually very quiet ones. They're subtle ones. They're not, they're not overt. Like I think a lot of times, and this is, I think, the, again, I could do a whole point on this thing. Like I think some of the misconceptions about addiction treatment is that somehow you go to treatment and all of a sudden I'm cured. You know, and the parents are like, why didn't you change my child in 30 days? I'm like, that's not how it works. Because um, it's, it's not. It's not instant. It's not an, not an instant change. You don't go to treatment all of a sudden and then everything's just perfect, hunky dory, and you love your family now. But I, I, I would say the big signs of that would just be subtle ones but consistent ones. So the, so the big thing I would, I would say to especially young people, progress would look like, can you show me consistency in a week? Can you show me consistency in a month? Can we, can we see consistent behaviors over time? A common one would actually be, particularly would be, uh, which I've done very common is, okay, let's, do, let's go to a meeting for 30 days. When you leave treatment, go for meeting for 30 days. Or another one, one is 90 for 90. They do 90 meetings in 90 days. Now, why do you start with that? Now, you may still feel miserable in those 90 days and still feel angry, but you're creating consistency. Consistency is being created. Consistency, which is such the opposite, the steadiness, the permanentness of the ups and downs of life. Another thing is ideas that hopefully, and maybe you see this with behavioral changes, like, well, can we create a structure calendar where you're remaining consistent in certain behaviors? It could be prayer. It could be could be actual degradal de- exercise. Now, again, we have to reevaluate over time. I wouldn't just be like, oh, they're going to meetings for 90 days. They're cured. You know, no more problems. But we start with that consistency. So a big piece would be, which, I mean, the truth of it, because addiction is hard. When I used to do uh, private practice, individual therapy, it would be hard. People, I, people wouldn't, couldn't do it. And we had to reevaluate. But I always try to tell, especially we had a, had a young person who she just got out of treatment I said the main goal right now for the family is that can she be doing something, something consistent every single day? Regardless of if she's feeling, let's start with consistency. Because the consistency can help you bring towards that attachment to something greater, ideally. I know I could ask you this outside of here, but I think this would benefit everyone. How do you teach slash learn in a simplistic way this delayed gratification? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I think... I've done a few angles. That actually, people, I've actually had people, someone disagree with me on this. I, one angle I do with de- delayed gratification is I, I think particularly, especially with young people, because I just think they kind of like hearing stories of heroes, is that I use great athletes. I, I know I, I go back to that sports, but it resonates with them. If, if you're a great athlete, if you're running the marathon, you've got to practice. You know that it's not just if you want to become the best, you know, I just use the example of like Michael Jordan. You want to become the best basketball player? player in the world. You don't just go to winning, you know, six NBA championships and MVPs and everything's perfect. You go with, you're a high school, it's three o'clock in the morning in North Carolina and you're taking three throws in your dad's, outside your dad's house. You start with that. You start with the reality of the put in, put in great achievements in life. You have to put in that discipline and you will not see instant results. And so hard, I think particularly when I look at kind of development for young people, adolescent psychological development, we live so much in a world of of this attachment to meritocracy, this attachment to success, immediate success in school and in college. So when what happens so much is that they don't, they see their, maybe their peers who are the perfect, you know, athlete, or the perfect student or the perfect, you know, artist and like, well, what are my gifts? 
well, maybe you do have gifts, but it'll, it takes place in time. I mean, to cultivate that, I think it's such, it's, I, I'm, I just, maybe I'm speaking out of bounds, but like it's such foreign in our culture because it's just, we, we just, we're so saturated with, there's got to be immediate success. And if there isn't, you don't have something profound and amazing happening immediately in your early days of your development, somehow life's not meaningful. But to teach, the, teach about the little things in life, the value of hard work. I think there was, there, I saw a quote one time of like the idea of like, let's pray for our families, our children to, to, to live a, a simple life. We should pray for that rather than saying, well, let's just hope they'll be the best of this and this. Now, that's hard to do because, again, even if you, if you can say that to, I, in groups, we talk about that, then they'll talk about, like, well, it's so hard people all around me. Like, I talk about, I had young guys who work with who, like, all their friends or their peers already have families and homes and they're still in early recovery and have nothing and they feel so worthless. Like, well, let's, let's take time with that. Let's cultivate that because the, the, the journey is long. We, wanna, we run a long race, not a short one. I have a question. Though. Yes. Um, hello, honey. This is my husband. Yes, this is my uh, wife speaking. Yes. <laughs> so um, I know you focus most of your lecture today on addiction and substance use, but since it seems like logotherapy was really born from a profoundly traumatic experience that Viktor Frankl experienced, um, how have you seen or do you imagine logotherapy to be applied to people who experience trauma, um, particularly complex trauma? I, I probably would go two angles with that. The, the first one would be on like a stabilization, stabilization level of, you know, one thing, if you've experienced intense, like, intense trauma, you and let's say people you to cope with that intense trauma, they either use intense drugs to first start with the idea, like, how can we embody principles of, uh, by principles of logotherapy to avoid unhealthy coping skills? So if someone comes in with intense trauma, intense PTSD, but they're heavily using drugs, well, we start with first stabilization. We're not going to address the trauma initially, so I, I wouldn't be like, let's find, let's find meaning in your life, so let's embrace the traumatic event right now. Well, hold on, we can't do that, because if the, the trauma is too intense, you, you won't find meaning, you'll be re-traumatized again. I start with instead with saying, well, let's move away from not using destructive coping skills to your pain. And actually, I would actually say that creates the groundwork, go find meaning. Because when you're not using destructive coping skills, you're moving away from a pleasure-centered way of thinking about life because i got to feel good to deal with my intense pain. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm beginning to confront or be able to approach the world of like, oh, no, I can persevere and transcend my trauma. Not so much I want to immediately confront it because I think sometimes... Uh, it could be misconstrued with Viktor Frankl's like, oh, we have to immediately go into the time that you experience the worst event in your life, rather than can we create the environment, the soil even, to bring forth the, the, the healing that can occur with finding something meaningful in your life from the pain in your life. I think particularly, anything with trauma things, you start with particularly making sure they've been stabilized too. I, I probably, on a more practical clinical sense, I wouldn't recommend local therapy if they're still actively using, you know, or they're cutting or actively engaged in self really destructive behaviors. I think would start with first with local therapy, with starting uh, starts starts therapy, with stabilizing that, and then addressing. Okay, let me look at meaning. So, so this might play into a little bit of what you were just talking about. But when you brought up the icon of the cru- crucifixion, um, what and you were talking about uh, the people that were in your sessions saying how bad they felt and how um, how terrible their life was and this and that their suffering. Uh, I also, it came to mind that at the crucifixion was also the thief on the cross. And um, he actually went through the process of forgiveness and was the first human actually into the kingdom of God. So, um, you know, I wanted to ask you, what about the concept of forgiveness, especially self-forgiveness in this, uh, in logotherapy? And how does that fit into it. And especially I work with, um, you know, I work at a community health center and, you know, it's really not a a situation where um, I'm invited to share my faith in in a sense. So, um, you know, how do you, but I see in my discussion with patients who are addicts, how much uh, forgiving themselves for their behavior is really the first step. Um, loving themselves and, and that whole concept of forgiveness. So I wanted to ask you, you know, what is your thought on that? Um, well, the, the way I look at it, uh, maybe a little bit about for forgiveness, and, and, and I think 
one angle I've described, we've done groups in forgiveness and I've described it as this, is forgiveness is also the, the difference opposed to extremes. Actually, one thing we've talked about, uh, I've used, done groups on this, about what the ego is or actually addiction. When we're, we're deep in our selfishness, when we're deep in our addiction, we're living in extremes. The extreme intensity of extreme guilt or shame. I, I despise myself so much, therefore my, I must drink or use. The extremes of a drug, I must feel the certain extreme state all the time. Or the extreme state of selfishness, I'm the per- I, there's no problems with me, I am perfect. You know, kind of two extremes. I'm the worst in the world, there's, I'm unredeemable, or I'm so perfect there's no problems with me. And I think addiction shatters that by saying in a gentle mindset, no, you are enough, you are worthy. Again, I just go back to the amazing lecture we just heard by Father Deacon Perry. Um, you know, Christ loves us. God loves us, even with our brokenness. Christ embraces us. In that weakness, he comes to us and embraces us. So sometimes I start with forgiveness, starting with gentleness particularly. And I actually think gentleness is a, a gentle mind. A lot of times with people, because right now I work with, uh, it's a facility I work as all female clients. There's a lot of cutting borderline personality disorder, it's so extreme with that. We work on, well, and cause I, they say, I hate myself so much, Dean, I hate myself, I don't, I wanna cut because I just have so much hatred to myself. I'm like, well, let's, let's not try to make you just feel positively good, let's start, start with gentleness. Can you be gentle on yourself first? And then from gentleness, maybe we can move toward, let's apply gentleness in a larger sense. And from gentleness, we can be gentle with other people. Gentleness toward things we believe in, and then gentleness toward God. And then maybe to connect the next point about how to incorporate spirituality into that, and God, particularly your faith, is that I, I, I believe in a God of peace. I believe in a God of gentleness. Not that it has to feel good all the time. I'm not talking about I'm a God of feel good and feel happy. I'm a God of, 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 of breaking those attachments to extremes and, and allowing to be okay, accept my imperfections, to be okay when I make mistakes. So I don't know if that, I'm trying to bridge both, both examples, what forgiveness is and how it connects to one's faith. I do think a lot of like this, when there's so much of that struggles to be kind to yourself, there's so much of that extreme, I'm kind of breaking that bond with that, so. Uh, thank you, yeah, yeah, yeah.